15 to 24. Now one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things. He said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of the God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And he never said, I have bought five yoke of auction, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still never said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and winds of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you, and none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to die. He was born to die. He's going to die for the sins of the world. And Jesus is teaching the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the ecclesiastical powers of the day. And Jesus has been a popular teacher with the crowds and the people. But among the religious elite, he's been suspicious. He's been questioned. And they've been watching him very closely like undercover agents. And so Jesus is now at a big dinner. He's been invited to this dinner by a ruler of the Pharisees. Of course, the Pharisees were the elite ones who spent all of their time studying the law and praying and engaging in worship. They were the ones who should have been prepared, most of all, for the coming of the Lord because they believed in the law. They believed in the prophets. But it's very interesting and even ironic that when Jesus came, who was the fulfillment, they rejected him. He's not what we expected. He's not what we want. So they had already been talking among themselves, how are we going to get rid of this guy? He condemns us as being hypocrites. He condemns us for our loving money. He condemns us for the way we treat people. He condemns us for our rules and our regulations and all the traditions that we've developed over hundreds of years. We've got to get rid of this guy. He's causing trouble. And so the Bible says Jesus is at this dinner party. He's been invited. As far as I know, Jesus never turned down a dinner invitation. And so he is there, and as he is there, the crowd start coming in, that the invitees. And suddenly, there appears at the door a man who's a party crasher. He wasn't invited. This man is diseased and deformed, and he is disgusting to the Pharisees. He's got dropsy or edema, an abnormal swelling of the limbs and the area around the heart. You know what congestive heart failure is. The fluid collects in your body, and if it's not taken off, it'll kill you. And so this man is swelling with fluid, and there's no physician that can help him. And so when he appears at the door, the Pharisees are wondering, what's Jesus going to do? Because we hear he's the healer. But today's a Sabbath day, and on the Sabbath day, one of our rules is, you shall not practice medicine on the Sabbath day. So what's he going to do? So Jesus turns and asks them a question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to heal or not? Of course, if they say, yes, it's lawful, then they condemn themselves. If he says, they say, no, it's not lawful, then they look inhumane and mean. So Jesus heals the man. Restores him to his health. He can go back now to his family and his work and his life. And he can live because he had a terminal condition. And then Jesus turns to those Pharisees and says, If one of you had a child or an ox 
that had fallen into a well on the Sabbath day, would you rescue him? And they wouldn't answer the question. Because they knew they would. Because they knew if they lost a donkey or an ox, they'd lose money. But if this man died, they lost nothing. So they cared more about sheep than they did about human beings. So Jesus has already embarrassed the whole group. He's insulted them by doing this act of healing, this act of mercy, and asking these questions to which they responded in deafening, stony silence. Then Jesus notices at the dinner party that all the people are jockeying to sit up front, closest to the host. Because the closer you sit to the host, the more important you are. So they were looking for status. And out of their pride, they wanted the cheap seats. Jesus said, when you go to a party, don't look for the best seat. Sit at the back. Because if you go to the front and that is somebody else's seat, he may say to you, Friend, you're in the wrong seat. You'll have to go back there. That would embarrass you. And if you go to the back, it may be that if you belong up front, the host may say, come on up here and sit where you belong. And then Jesus said, everyone that exalts himself shall be humiliated or humbled, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So Jesus insults the guests. Then they're all seated, they're having the dinner, and he turns to the host, the man in charge. And he notices that all the people here at the dinner, they're rich, they're powerful, they're neighbors, they're friends, they're the religious elite. And Jesus says, when you give a party, don't invite the rich, your brothers, your uh, rich neighbors, your friends. Invite the poor, the lame, the blind, and the crippled. Because they cannot repay you. And you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You see, they were inviting the powerful and the rich to their parties because they wanted a reciprocation. I invite you to my party, now you invite me to your party. Tit for tat. That's what they thought. <coughs> Jesus says, no, that's not right. Invite people that can't pay you back because God will repay you in the world to come. So Jesus insults the host. Jesus is making everybody mad. He's insulted the guest. He's insulted the host. The older I get, the bolder I get. Because you see, I don't have anything to say anymore. I'm not worried about a career. I'm not worried about being written up in the gospel papers. I'm not written about popularity and prestige. I can just be myself. And that's the way Jesus was. He said, I'm not here to please you. I'm here to teach you. I'm here to save you. I'm here to open the eyes of the blind so that you can see reality. And so Jesus doesn't mind teaching the truth even though it's unpopular with the listener. So then Jesus tells a story. I like Jesus' stories. One third of Jesus' teaching is a story. So he tells a story about a man that gave a big banquet. Now you know when you give a big banquet, it takes a lot of work. I mean, this is not just a sit down to a Coke and some crackers. This is a big banquet. And he sent out invitations. Now in the Bible, there's such a thing as double invitations. And what that means is that when you plan a party, you go send an invitation by your servant and tell everybody, hey, we're going to have a big banquet on a certain day and you're invited. And those that accept the invitation said, yes, I'll be there. Count me in. RSVP is what it is. So then the servant goes back and tells the host of the master, says, yes, this many people are coming. They've all agreed to come. They're going to be here on a certain day. He says, great. We'll start making preparations. And you know, there's a lot of preparation to be made to have people in your house for dinner. And there's a lot of preparation to be made if you're having a whole community over. You've got to get all the food ready. You can't just serve them, you know. 
uh, a small bit of, of a meal, you got to maybe kill the fatty cat. They did. They had to get the salads, the vegetables, the seeding. They had to plan everything. And so the man goes about and he plans the big banquet. The day of the banquet arrives. The ox has been roasted. The vegetables have been picked and washed and dressed and ready to eat. And everything is in preparation. Then he sends his servant out on the day of the banquet and tells the people invited, Today is the banquet. Come on. All things are ready. Come now. This isn't the first time they heard about the banquet. They heard about it before. They had already agreed to come. But you see, in Bible times, they didn't have wristwatches. They didn't have calendars like we do. They didn't have alarms on their cell phone. And so, uh, sometimes by the sun, you couldn't tell exactly what time it was. And, and people uh, could uh, get other things that clutter up the day. And so the servant goes, says, this is the day. All things are ready. Come on now to the banquet. The first man that hears the invitation says, yeah, today is the day, isn't it? But you know what? I need to be excused. And he says, I'm going to be excused because uh, I have uh, just bought some land. And I've got to go look at it. Now, have you ever bought anything without looking at it? You just don't shop blind. You, you don't buy a car without trying it out or looking at it or a piece of land or a tractor. You want to inspect it. You want to look at it. Nobody would go out and buy a farm that never seen or didn't know anything about it. God says, I bought this land. I'm going to go look at it. Well, he probably had already seen the land. Maybe he's going to complete the deal by signing the deed that day or whatever. I don't know. But he said, i got to go look at my land. Please have me excused. He's kind of courteous, isn't he? Please have me excused. It's still an excuse, though. Now, this man didn't say, well, I'm going to go out and get drunk, or I'm going to go out and uh, quit God and, and party and, and do things immoral and illegal. No, I'm just going to do something people do in ordinary life. I'm just going to go and look at a piece of land. Nothing wrong with what that man is saying, except the priority in his life is not the bank. He's got other things to do that are crowded out his commitment. Now, he's already committed to be there. But he says, please, excuse me, I'm not able to make it. You know, when you do a lot of preparation like that, someone says they can't come, that had they planned to come and told you they would come, it's a great disappointment. Our daughter, Tiana, got married about 1999 in San Angelo, Texas. We had it at the River Club there. I remember in those days, I thought it was a lot of money, $10 was late. Everybody that came had to pay ten dollars. We had to pay ten dollars. So we sent out the invitations. Got the RSVPs. When we had the wedding, I remember seventeen people that RSVPed. I'll be there. Didn't come. So I had to shell out hundred and seventy dollars extra for people that didn't show up because the food was already cooked and ready. And so. The owner of the river club says, you owe me. Well, then what's this man going to do with all this food if these people aren't showing up? They don't have refrigeration. They don't have freezers. The ox has been cooked. What are you going to do with it? you got to eat it or throw it out. So the man says, I'm not coming. So the servant goes to the second guy and he says, uh, all things are ready. Come to the feast. Today's the day. This is the hour. Come now. And this guy says, well, you know what? I bought five yoke of oxen. I've got to take care of them. I've got to go try them out. See if they work. Now, would you buy a tractor that wouldn't run? Would you buy a car that didn't have an engine in it? This guy, he'd already seen these oxen. He'd already bought them. He just now going to go try them out. That is working in the field. Five yoke of oxen. Do you know how many oxen that is? A yoke is, holds two. He's got 10 oxen. He's got 20,000 pounds of meat on the hoof. He put a big investment in it. And he must have a big farm. He's a rich farmer. Because the average farmer, we read in Jesus' day, only had five or six acres, if that was. And if he had an ox, he only had one. This guy's got 10. He must have 100 acres. And he says, i got to go try these oxen out. Excuse me. 
Well, he's polite too. And his problem is not with the oxen, it's with his priorities. There's nothing wrong with trying out oxen. His problem is he is putting property, economics, above the bank. So the first fellow has a real estate problem. The second fellow has a bovine problem. Nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves except when they crowd out what's most important. So the servant goes to the third guy that had already RSVP'd and says, hey, it's time for the banquet. Come on. And the guy says, look, I'm sorry I can't come. I married a wife and cannot come. Now this guy thought he had a scriptural reason. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 5, it says, when you marry a wife, you do not have to go to war for a year. Now, why did God say that? Because you go to war, you might get killed and leave the bride a, a widow and never got to have children with her and never got to live with her very long. But the servant is not inviting the man to fight or to go to war. He's inviting him to a dinner party. And why couldn't he bring his wife with him? I'm sure if he had said to the host, you know what, in the meantime, I got married. I'd like to bring my wife. The host would say, sure, we got plenty of food. Yes, we'd all like to meet her. Bring her. Or if it's a men's only party, he could have gone by himself and left his wife at home. She'd be, up, she'd be there when he got back. And probably she would enjoy a night away from him. <laughs> And he might enjoy a night away from her. I know that happens in our marriage sometimes. I've had obligations to go out of town or speak somewhere for two or three days or go somewhere. She just says, well, I'm going to have a little peace. <laughs> a lot of peace. And so this is an excuse. Is there anything wrong with getting married? No. Anything wrong with taking care of your wife? No. But when you put that priority above coming to the banquet that you've already committed to come, you're making a big mistake. These men are all making social etiquette mistakes. And so the Bible says, the servant comes home and he says, look, all the people we invited, they're not going to come. And the host says, look, I've got the ox, it's already cooked. We've got all the food ready. What am I going to do with all of this? He says, I'll tell you what. Go out and invite some people that have never been invited yet. Go out uh, and, and bring in the poor, the lame, the blind, the crippled. Exactly the four categories Jesus had told the host in verse 13 that he should invite. Invite those folks. The poor are those people that sleep under the bridge. They're homeless. They've never been to a big party. Now, folks, this is not going to McDonald's. This is going to Ruth Chris Steakhouse. This is a big banquet. And he said, bring all those people in. And so the man goes out, goes all over the city, and finds everybody. You come to the banquet. Come on, come on, come on. He invites all these cities. Then he comes back and says, well, I invited them all. But there they are. And the master looks around and says, well, we still got room. I still got food. Go outside the city. Go into the highways and the hedges. You know what hedges are? Hedges are the little lanes that go off the highway. Sometimes vineyards were separated by shrubs, like houses are sometimes. And go out behind all the shrubs and see if you can find anybody sleeping under a bush. Anybody. Bring them. I want everybody, I want my house to be filled. And I want you to know that not one of those who were invited shall eat of my family. Now what's he saying here? What's this story mean? Well this story is not perfectly analogous with Jesus in the Great Commission. But there are some references here that kind of open our eyes to some things. 
Why did the first three men miss the banquet? Why? Was it the host's fault? Was it because they weren't invited? Was it because there wasn't enough food? Was it because they didn't know about it? Was it because the invitation caught them by surprise? No. They had other things they wanted to do. One in real estate, one in cattle, and one in family. Nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves. But when they are allowed to come ahead of the responsibility of honoring your commitment to come to the banquet, they become wrong in and of themselves because of their relationship. They miss the banquet because of their own fault. And notice that he says, bring in the people from the city, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Bring them on. If the first group of people in the story refer to the Pharisees, those who knew the law and the prophets and that were looking for a Savior and a Messiah, the Son of David is coming. And now that He's here, they reject Him. The second group of people then would represent the common ordinary Jew. Maybe who's not a scholar in the law, who doesn't know all these things, who, who's not a professional religionist. And the Lord is inviting all of them. And then the third group of people out in the highways outside the city and sleeping under the hedges and found in the places where you have to go look them up, that might refer to the rest of the world, to the Gentile nations. And what does that say about God? He wants His house filled. And so in the book of Acts, we have they preach the gospel first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the innermost parts of the earth. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and make disciples of all the nations. And so Paul could write that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's God's power to salvation to the Jew first and to the Gentile. And he could write in Galatians, You're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ to put on Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And so it illustrates God's great plan to encompass the whole world. He wants His banquet filled with people from everywhere, of every race and every background and every language and every religious background. He wants them brought into the banquet. There is no mechanical one-for-one -one predestination here. Everybody's invited. The problem is the person rejected the invitation. The last sentence. I tell you, the word you in the Greek is plural. You'll notice that footnote says it in some of our Bibles. Plural you. It's like in Alabama. We say you all. I know you say that in Illinois sometimes too. You all. You can be an individual. It could be you all, so you is you, you don't know. But in the Greek, you can tell the difference in the grammar. So he says, I tell you all. He's not just talking to the servant, he's one person. But he says, I tell you all, as though Jesus looks up from the story, interjects himself into it, and says to everybody there at this Pharisee's banquet, I tell you all that none of you who've been invited originally the teas were tasted. So what's the point? The point is God wants everybody in the banquet. There's not anybody in this world that God doesn't love and God cannot save. And the gospel is for all. And we need to love all and teach all and bring all and pray for all. No matter who they are or what color their skin is or what their background is or what they've done in the past. They're invited. Come unto me, all you that weary and are heavy laden. And the last chapter of the Bible, the next to the last paragraph says, the Spirit and the Bride say, come, and whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. So everybody's invited to the banquet. 
second thing is, those who miss the banquet, it's their fault. It's their fault. So the question today is, are you feasting at the Lord's table, enjoying the delights of the Lord? Or are you still on the outside looking in? Now this is a banquet. And a banquet here means that God has graciously provided everything you need in Jesus Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. There is not anything that any of us need that is not found in Jesus Christ our Lord. What do you need? Forgiveness, hope, eternal life, peace, relationships, knowledge of God. Forgiveness of sins. It's all there in Christ. It's a feast. It's a banquet. God has graciously supplied everything we need in Christ. And you're invited. You're invited. And if you don't participate in the banquet, it's not God's fault. It's not Jesus' fault. It's not the Holy Spirit's fault. It's not the Bible's fault. It's not the preacher's fault. It's not the church's fault. Whose fault is it? It's your own. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever will. Whosoever will. And today, if anyone would like to be, become a Christian, to take to the banquet table, to believe, to repent, to be baptized, we're here to help you. And if anybody else would like to have prayers or Bible study or counseling, we can help you in any way, we invite you. You're invited. Come to the feast. Come to the banquet. Let's stand in the same way.